Thank you very much there. Uh, we'll just get started. People will roll in here when they get to here. Uh, I, I've got an outline here that I'm going to try to follow. Uh, the overheads will try to keep me on, on cue here. But I want to talk about agriculture and its U.S. agriculture and its dependence on exports. Okay? We are dependent. And then I want to talk about the factors that affect U.S. demand or demand for U.S. exports and trade policies in U.S. exports, what's happening, forces that are going to affect our exportable surplus. I want to define what that is, get everyone on the same page there. Talk about economic growth in developing world, population trends, what's happening there, emerging policy changes and trends, and get all the way down here to what are the consequences and the impacts on Texas. Okay, well let's start out. Agriculture. We produce about 250 million acres of crops of corn, soybeans, wheat, sorghum, rice, and cotton. Okay, these are the acreages that were planted last year, 2014. What's important here for this discussion is a percent of these crops that we exported. 13% of our, all of our corn went overseas. This is way down from what it used to be. We used to export much greater percent of our corn until we created something called the Renewable Fuel Standard and 15 billion gallons of ethanol mandatory. Soybeans, we export 46% of all of our soybeans. 42% okay? of our wheat, 81% of our sorghum last year. Sorghum exports jumped last year because of a particular little issue called GMOs. I'll talk about that shortly. Rice, we export almost half our rice and 69% of our cotton. Yes, we are really dependent upon exports. What has all this export opportunity done for us? It's given us the opportunity to go to economies of scale, economies of size on, in agriculture that are not enjoyed in most other countries. We have large, efficient farms. The customers benefit, our consumers benefit greatly from this because we have lower food prices and we have stable, stable supply of food of high quality. Well, the three things you're looking for. Economic benefits, we also get those in terms of increased employment. We, hit, we create jobs because of agriculture not just on the farm, but in food processing, food transportation, and the export market. Okay. How tied are we to, in Texas, to the national prices and world prices? I took this graph of corn price in Texas, the black line, the U.S. red line. Notice how they move together. Basically, if the U.S. gets a hicca, if the U.S. gets a sniffles, in terms of prices, we're going to catch pneumonia. Okay? Our prices in, te in Texas are just a little bit higher than the U.S. Average, national average price. Why? Because we feed a lot of cattle here and we're corn deficient and we have to import it. So we can pay a little bit more for it. Most all crops are like that. Texas, U.S. prices follow each other very closely. Texas prices and U.S. prices are dependent upon demand and supply factors. Okay, we've got a, kind of a free market in this country. Let's look at the factors of demand that affect our exports of food. Okay, factors of demand. These are the things that will shift it out or bring it back. Okay. Look at world population, value of the dollar, income levels, taste, preferences, etc. Let's go through them one at a time. Okay, population. Increase in world population is going in the rest of the world. That's what the ROW stands for. It's a slang economist term for the rest of the world. Okay, population is going to drag our export demand function out to the right. It's going to increase our demands. Income in the rest of the world is going to increase our demands because they can afford to pay for food. It's called an effective demand. You can have a demand for something, but if you don't have the money for it, you do not have an effective demand. New term. Okay. What are the things that pull this thing back? Well, production in the rest of the world, a strong U.S. dollar. We all like to think of, you know, we're, we're Americans, we want to be proud of our dollar. It's a strong dollar. It's the worst thing we can do for agriculture because it makes our food more expensive 
for someone on the other side trying to buy it. So agriculture benefits from a weak dollar. What do we have right now? We have one of the strongest dollars we've seen in years relative to our importing, importing partners. Let's look at this one. Anti-GMO and animal hormone. Okay. There's a very strong movement in the EU and in some African countries to be anti-GMO. Okay. Because of that, that pulls the demand function back. We're not exporting some of our commodities to the Europe, European market. We don't export long grain rice to the Europeans because there was a GMO accidental release in 2006 and they got upset over that and they still haven't started buying our long grain rice. Okay? Now, if we started putting GMOs and other things, they wouldn't buy it either. They don't buy our corn seed. Okay? Let's look at trade policies. There is a organization called the World Trade Organization, WTO. They, and the original idea of WTO was part of, formed out of the GATT negotiations, the last round of GATT. WTO's goal, ideal, is free trade across the world. Well, we can't get there. We're trying to get there in little bitty steps, but we're taking very baby steps right now. And so we put in this thing called a tariff rate quotas, and then we allow things for embargoes, allow embargoes. Okay? That's one of the things WTO should have said, there ain't no way you can ever have a bar embargo. They just should not exist. Okay? They permit those. Okay, we have regional restrictions like the EU says we don't want anything with a GMO in it. They've even been close to a GMO. That's a trade restriction. Okay, we also allow phytosanitary restrictions. Say, well, the U.S. says we don't want to really import that particular melon from Mexico because it may have been you grown with DDT or something. Okay, that's permitted. Okay, most of these phytosanitary restrictions are coming way down. They're not reducing our, our demand for exports at this point. We've got some court cases like the cotton case. Okay? Brazil sued the U.S. over price manipulation through our farm programs, and they won the case. We appealed it. They won an appeal. We've countered, we, fi we paid fines and fines and fines, and then we rewrote a farm program and took away all the farm program benefits for cotton. Okay? That's what kind kind of things happening out there in policy. Let's look at what all this does to exportable demand for food from the U.S. Again, population in the rest of the world, income in the rest of the world. Those are shifters. Embargoes, phytosanitary, tariff rate quotas, non-GMO concerns, all of those are pulling back our demand for exports. Okay. Now, let's look at exportable surplus. Now, I'll give you a new term. Exportable surplus is what we produce that we don't eat at home. Okay, that's pretty easy to consider. If you had a family garden, you eat what you, you know, like Bluebell used to say, we eat all, all we can and we sell the rest. Okay, that's the way we do with a family garden. Well, that's what we're doing with the U.S. in terms of our corn, soybeans, and rice, and cotton, and wheat. But our stable U.S. economy with low interest rates and our land-grant university system that has generated technology, all of those things have combined together to give us a very productive agricultural system in the U.S. Okay? Technology rolls out every year. Farmers adopt it because why? We have a stable income. We have a stable economy. We have low interest rates. They know they can sell it, and they can sell the surplus overseas. Okay. So our land grant system is out there helping us with new technology, and that new technology comes in many forms, mechanical as well as crop and livestock. We have a large per capita income in the U.S., which gives us a very stable demand here in the U.S. Our population has been growing at about 1% a year. We have very productive lands, and we have crops that are suited to the climates that we have in this country. Okay? Very unique situation. 
Farm programs help to manage risk and encourage technology adoption, no doubt about it. Okay? We have a renewable fuels policy that says we're going to produce 15 billion gallons of ethanol a year come hell or high water. Okay? And this itself has reduced our corn exports. We know that. We've taken a black eye on the world market because of it. But it's increased the DDGs that we have available to export. We produce 17.9 pounds of DDGs for every bushel of corn. Okay? So let's look at what all these things do to our supply function. As our population grows and their income grows, we're going to export less of our food. Okay? And a renewable fuel standard have shifted that back. Now climate's kind of up in the air. I don't know which way it's going to go. We talk about climate change. There are some regions in the country are going to see lower yields, and so lower exportable surplus from those regions. Others could actually see increased yields. Okay, we may be shifting. Now I've been looking at some recent climate change analyses, and they're showing very, very small changes in the yields of corn and soybeans and wheat. I expected huge changes. I got into this research project expecting to have big changes that I would be analyzing the farm level impacts on. There's, there are little tiny changes over the next 10, 15 years, and you know, I don't plan on living much longer, so <laughs> that's in my horizon, okay? So climate change could go either way. Technology, we're always going to have technology, and every time we get new technology, it pushes our exportable surplus out. We have more that we can ship overseas. Irrigation, we were becoming much more efficient in irrigation. Instead of throwing the water up in the air and hoping it falls on the crops, we're dribbling it down on the ground and we're sending it underground to the, to the root zone itself. We have this stable economy and I don't think that's going to change and I think change and that's what's helping drive our technology adoption out there. Okay? Mechanization, economies of size, once we've achieved economies of size, we know what it's like and how much it lowers our cost of production per unit, and we're pushing that further and further out. Okay? Now, let's look at things that are happening in the rest of the world in terms of economic growth. There's a pattern in economic growth in the rest of the world. It starts like this. Incomes increase, followed by in changes in their demand. And what do they demand? They demand more protein and better cooking oil. Now, I'll give you the two leading examples. They're China and India. Over the last 10 years, what have they done? They've increased their demand for imports of corn, soybean meals, and DDGS. Okay? Why are they importing these basic commodities? To feed the poultry and the pork and the beef in those countries. Not so much beef in India, I'm sorry. But they bought a lot of cooking oil, I'll put, point that out. <clears throat> okay. The main thing here is the change in income on these countries helped shift our demand function out so far that in 2008 we had what was called a food versus fuel controversy. Everyone remember that? Okay, we all said ethanol was a bad guy and had a black eye. Well, the analysis we did in our policy center said, no, not quite. There was such a sh shift in the demand for protein around the world during that time that it combined with ethanol and the change in the value of the dollar. We had a cheap dollar at the time so we could export more. All of those things combined together to result in some of the highest corn and soybean meal prices we'd ever seen. Sure, that's the way it happened. What's the outlook for exports? Well, let's look at it. Population growth. Everyone shows this graph. I like it. And you know, we've got 7.2 billion people in the world right now. And depending on who you talk to and what day it is, it's either 9 billion or 9.3 billion or 9.5 billion by 2050. Increase in population that much, that means that demand function I showed you a while ago is going to jump way out there, isn't it? Yeah, if they have income, if they have effective demand. One of our problems with that population growth is 
This is a place where most of that growth is going to occur. They've got 15% of the world population. They're going to 25%. Asia and Oceania is going to go from 61% of the world to 55%. These people don't have the money to buy the food right now. They're going to have to grow it. They're going to have to grow their own food. Okay. There are some scary thoughts to that. Emerging policy changes. You know, one of the, the emerging policy changes that hit us this month was China making the decision you can now have two children per family. That has not been factored into any of these per population growth projections. So instead of 9 billion, could we think about maybe 11 billion by 2050? Just two children. Now, the, the stuff I picked up in the press is kind of, there's a great deal of uncertainty about whether everyone's going to run out and have another kid, okay? You know, it costs a lot of money to raise a child in China and then send them to the U.S. to be educated. <laughs> I didn't say that, okay? Don't quote me on that one. Uh, but there, there's a significant number of people who feel that they're overcrowded right now with one child per family, okay? And so there's going to be some pushback on that. There's not, it's not going to be immediate, but we are going to expect to see some in more rapid growth in that. And so if we go back to this slide here, instead of dropping from 61 to 55 percent, they may stay level. They may actually change that. Okay. This other concern really has me bugged. This anti-GMO concern in the European Union is being transferred on purpose or by accident or osmosis to the developing countries in Africa. Okay? But the people there are saying, what's good for Europe, and those white dudes over there, must be good for us too. So we don't want any GMOs. Okay? Those people are hungry right now. If they don't buy get more food from GMOs, where are they going to get it? Okay? So that one really worries me. There's, and this concern across the world is depressing the supply and technology adoption. And I don't see a way around it unless we change people's preferences and attitudes. Okay? Cheaper energy. Right now we've got cheapest energy. We've heard that two times today. And our last speaker has made me sure that uh, electricity is even going to get cheaper because we're going to all be supplying it ourselves. Okay. Cheaper food, cheaper energy has another effect on it. It reduces the cost of exporting because it reduces the cost of transporting and processing food. Okay. Right now, do you realize that there's a significant glut? The first time we've ever had a glut in the number of ocean-going freighters. Okay? Companies are canceling orders for ocean going freighters right now. Why? That's, a, that's an oddity. It's cheaper to transport now. We should be seeing more freighters being used, but they're not. They're cutting back. Uh, cheaper fuel costs for irrigation, fertilizer production, tractors, etc. All of these things are going to be there to help us export more, produce more, produce at a lower cost. Climate change could possibly shift the production capabilities of different regions. And again, I don't know where. I don't know. Now let's get back to some basic economics. Everyone's seen these supply and demand charts. Okay, this is demand for those of you who are asleep in 101 economics. This is a shift in demand from here to here, okay? This, this is a shift from here to here. It's not an increase in demand, it's a shift in demand. This is my projection of what demand would look like because of population, income, growth, and developing world, okay? If that happens and we're restricted to stay on this current supply function and the experiment stations all shut down and we don't get any new technology out, and the extension doesn't extend anything, Travis, okay? We're going to see prices jump way up here. Why? Because this is a very inelastic demand function. Okay. But if we can get to move our supply function out, okay, 
with non-GMO technology because the rest of the world who are our customers don't want GMOs. Look at what happened with China in November of 2013. They said, there's a GMO in this corn that you sent us. We don't any, want any more corn from the U.S. That happened in November of 13. It was December of 14 before they said, okay, we will accept corn with this particular GMO in it, but they still aren't importing our corn. How long is that going to last? Don't really know. I wish I did. Okay. If we have to live with no GMO technology, we're going to see prices drop from that P1 down to about a P2 because supply will shift out. I'm going to suggest that if we can change the world's perception of GMOs and animal antibiotics and growth hormones, we can probably see this shift out here and we can feed a large portion of that 9 or 11 billion people by 2050. But unless we do, we're going to see a lot of hungry people paying high prices. Consequences for our U.S. agriculture. So let's bring this back home. We're going to see an increased demand for feed grains, oil seeds, and meat protein. That's the first thing we can count on because increased incomes around the world are going to demand protein. And it's most efficient to grow your protein at home. Okay? Unless you're Russia, they import our chicken. Okay. Or they did until they found some animal growth hormones in it. But you know what? I really think hungry people don't care about GMOs and animal growth hormones. Okay, but we aren't there yet. We're going to see increased demand for food and increased crop prices. This is going to lead to an increased value of food, of inputs used to produce food. First thing I think we're going to see is land prices are going to increase. So if you don't own a farm today, go out and buy one. It's going to be a good investment. Okay, you heard it here first. <laughs> I've got some land to sell. Okay. There is going to be pressure on Congress to release the CRP acreage, okay? Let me take you back in time to the 1960s. Yes, I'm old. Okay, in the 1960s and 1970s, we had supply control programs. We had set-asides and diversion programs in this country for our farm program. And we idled 15 to 30 percent of our cropland from year to year. That gave the U.S a horrible black eye by the rest of the world. The rest of the world was hungry, some of them was starving, and they looked at the U.S. as being stingy. We're not producing on those acres. Now, we currently have somewhere between 36 and 30 million acres of cropland that have been idled under the CRP. You think when we get hungry out there in the rest of the world, they're not going to ask Congress to get completely get rid of that? Now, we've already had pressure on Congress in this last farm bill to reduce the CRP over the next five years. We're not going to be renewing contracts. We've already seen that pressure coming. Where did that pressure come from? Organizations like Oxfam were lobbying our U.S. Congress to get that policy put in place. Okay. I'm going to see a, a predict, we're going to see some fairly high prices for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Okay. Even though we have cheaper energy, we're still going to bid up the price of nitrogen. Seed costs are going to increase because there's going to be greater reliance on GMOs to give us drought tolerance and salinity tolerance in our crops. Those are the two things we really need. Okay. Water will be more extensively used for irrigation. Its value for producing food is going to go up, not to the $2,000 an acre feet that that I heard earlier today when I came in. And farm programs are likely going to shift to encourage farmers to produce more. That could be in terms of let's actually go in with high price and income supports and get back to where we were in the 60s of trying to increase production on one side. Okay. Unintended consequences for U.S. agriculture. I think we'll see a lot more rapid drawdown of our aquifers, wherever they are, all over the U.S. We're going to see an increase in soil erosion because if we bring in that marginal CRP land, it's going to erode. It, there's nothing we can do for it. And that has all kinds of unintended consequences. Increased salinity or 
increased soil movement into our waterways and filling up our lakes and ponds with sediments. Okay, not a nice picture. Increased energy used to pump water, transport more produce, and we're going to be producing more food. We're going to have to transport more of it. There are going to be more trucks and trains being involved here, and that takes energy. And it's going to take more energy to produce nitrogen fertilizer. We may see some microclimate changes. As you change large acreages of pasture land into cropland, it could cause a microclimate change. Okay? We've seen some of that. More rapid change in farm structure. This is the one that probably is going to be the most socially unacceptable. Our large, efficient family farms are going to gobble up their neighbors who are less efficient. That will happen. It's been happening since 1900. It'll continue. Okay. What happens there is we've got a farmer that's more productive, higher efficiency, more output per acre, however you want to say it, they are making more profit per acre than their neighbor, who has a higher cost of production, making less money. Who's going to buy up that land? Okay, It's going to be the farmer who is more efficient, higher productivity. This is not going to be popular, but it's going to happen. <clears throat> there will be more dependence on GMO enhanced seeds. Whether the world likes it or not, that's what they're going to do. What are these consequences for Texas? So I brought it to the U.S. Now let's bring it down to Texas. First and foremost, Texas depends on exports. We have to keep the exports flowing. This means we have to be actively involved in policy, such as TPP and other trade promotion programs. We've got probable consequences for increased world population. Let's just list them. Higher crop prices. So increased GDP for the state of Texas. Okay. Higher land values. That means higher property taxes accumulated at the, the county level. More rapid change in farm structure. Economies of size. We'll have fewer farmers out there. That means we have fewer rural voters out there. That is a political problem we have. We have a more rapid drawdown on our Ogallala Aquifer. We're going to have a rapid change in farm structure. We've already got some 20,000 acre farms out there in the High Plains. We're going to see some more of them. Okay, they're efficient. Okay. We're going to have fewer of, those, of the small family farms. We're going to have large family farms. Now, I'm not talking large corporations coming in and buying up Texas agriculture. I'm talking about families owning large farms. We're going to see increased use of our marginal lands in Texas. Wait, that defines almost all the land in Texas, doesn't it, Travis? OK. So we're going to use more of it. And it could increase our erosion. We're going to see a reduced number of acres of pasture as it's converted to cropland. I think that'll happen out there. Greater reliance on GMO seeds. Definitely drought tolerant. Any kind of GMO organism would be put in there to make our crops more drought tolerant. It's going to be wrapped around. I think wheat would just love to have a drought-tolerant wheat variety right now, since two-thirds of it's grown dry land, right? We're going to see higher food prices for everyone. This country, the rest of the world, higher food prices. Hopefully our incomes are going to go up so we don't go down in our living standard. Increased demand for food, fuel to grow crops. This is going to have an upward pressure on our fuel prices. Increased number of jobs uh, in the agriculture sector. And greater reliance on mechanizations to produce food. Okay? We're going to use less manual labor, more mechanization, larger equipment. Okay? There we go. Summary. U.S. and Texas agriculture uh, are dependent on exports. I have to say this over and over and over. Worlds depend on exports for food from the U.S., okay? You look at it, Brazil, Argentina, Australia, the U.S. A new player in the export market is Ukraine. You know why the Ukraine is exporting now? Because China went over there and invested a lot of money in it. China went to an unusual place. I didn't expect this at all. But they went to Ethiopia and rented you can't buy land in, in Ethiopia. 
they have a long-term lease on 50,000 hectares of land in Ethiopia. And that food's not going to stay in Ethiopia, by the way. It's going to go right back to China. Okay? So China's investing in foreign countries to grow food. This is going to happen on and on. We saw this once before. Some of you here have got enough gray hair that remember the great Russian grain embargo that uh, we had. Okay. What happened as a result of that? Okay, here's the circumstances. We got upset with Russia. They invaded Afghanistan, something like that. Yeah. Okay, that was the second one. That was in 78. 73 was the first one. Russia came over and bought a bunch of grain. But our embargo in 78 did the following. It encouraged and emboldened the rest of the world to invest in corn, soybean, and cotton production in Brazil and Argentina. That's when those countries really came on. Who was investing over there? Japan and China. Okay. Is it going to happen again? Sure. It's already happening. So there are going to be policy changes that either decrease or increase the U.S.'s ability to supply food to the rest of the world. We're going to see increased production in the rest of the world because the rest of the world actually thinks we're undependable suppliers. Okay, we've got several incidences where we used embargoes to reduce exports to countries we didn't like. Attitudes towards technology and GMOs in particular are going to have to change one of these days to ensure the U.S.'s export potential. We're going to see increased reliance on U.S. food to, re to cover the required production on on marginal land, okay. We're going to force. We'll f see changes in trade policies from the U.S. How we interact with WTO and how WTO interacts with the rest of the world. Those changes are going to happen, and there's going to be pressure to feed the world, and it will result in a conflict on many of the ideals that we have in this country. But change is on the way, so we better figure out how to do it now. Policy is, policy is probably the best way to do it. 